2 o'clock, um, and I've got a bunch of material to through here. Uh, my name is Adam Jordans. I'm on the delivery engineering team here at Netflix. That's my Slack, my Twitter, my Medium handle. If you ever want to get hold of me, uh, hit me up there. Uh, and I'm going to spend the next 40 minutes or so uh, just talking about how we scale Spinnaker here at Netflix. And when I say scale, I mean both from the business context, how have we been able to uh, enhance and extend Spinnaker, integrate with Netflix specific services in a way that doesn't necessarily mean we have to open source everything, but that we can open source where appropriate. Um, as well as obviously how have we managed to scale from four or 500 deployments per day to the four or 5,000 deployments a day that we're seeing right now. I kind of want everybody to leave this session with a little bit more clarity around three things. Um, better understanding of why it is we built Spinnaker in the first place and how what its role is right now at Netflix and how do we see it changing over time. Can everybody hear me in the back? Perfect. Uh, I don't know what those funny lines are. Um, I blame uh, Google Slides. There are a few Google people in the uh, in the audience. Maybe, maybe I can fix that. <laughs> um, I'll get right up. <laughs> yeah, aren't you an SRE? Like I got lines in my well, they're lines. So. Uh, <laughs> they go away when I move my mouse. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to spend some time talking about uh, how we operate Spinnaker, um, some interesting stories. We've got some more stories around uh, running this thing in production for the last, oh, three years or so. Um, hopefully, in part, some useful techniques that might be applicable to your organization. Uh, and then we can talk a little bit about uh, the future of Spinnaker. Where are we going at Netflix? Our team is growing. What, what do we need 12 engineers to work on? This might look like a cute little one of those demotivational um, posters, but the last sentence kind of hits home for me. The kind robots will be doing soon, and it's talking about jobs. And we really see Spinnaker as an intelligent machine that eventually, perhaps given a bit of metadata about an application, can start to make intelligent decisions on how it should be deployed. We don't want individual engineers here at Netflix to really have to worry about what regions their application is deploying into, um, what time of day they can deploy, what instance types they should be using. Over time, we've been building up this context, and Spinnaker uh, should reach a point where it has enough information to make these decisions. We hire engineers to be domain experts in, the, in particular domains. They might be an encoding expert, they might be an algorithms expert. They're not necessarily going to be experts in the cloud and how they deploy their applications. And right now, um, they might need to know a little bit too much about that. So looking historically at a system called Asgard, who's heard of the Asgard? Anybody? Sweet. Most of the audience. That's awesome. Um, so Asgard here at Netflix was single account. Uh, so we, at the time of Asgard's prominence here, um, <laughs> We probably only had about seven or eight accounts. So we were running seven or eight different Asgards. Every time we had a feature or we needed to push a bug fix, we needed to actually push out seven or eight different versions of, or push to seven or eight different accounts. Um, it was a burden. We hated it. We didn't like it. Um, so we thought that the replacement for Asgard, Spinnaker, needed to be multi-account aware. So what we have right now is a Spinnaker that we can deploy into a single account and it's able to reach out and manage all the accounts at Netflix. We've got probably on the order of a couple dozen accounts hooked up to Spinnaker right now. And we'll talk a little bit more later on about what we see our account growth uh, to be. Asgard provided um, a lot of uh, kind of management control plane activities. That was one of the big things that it offered um, over, say, the AWS console. Engineers could go to Asgard, they could see all their instances across, well, in Asgard's case, it was probably a single region and a single account. Uh, with Spinnaker, we wanted to build on top of that and provide a view across all accounts that an application might be deployed into, and specifically regions. Because most of the account, or most of the applications here at Netflix are deployed in multiple regions, and it doesn't make sense to have to click dropdowns or go to separate applications just to see the overall footprint. 
we certainly let's codify all of our uh, historical best practices, <coughs> stuff like red, black, or as the rest of the world calls it, blue, green. Uh, it's something that we want to be um, almost a native default for all applications, as well as be able to layer in new best practices as they as they emerge. Um, the big one for us is canaries and the fact that all tier one streaming applications effectively must have a canary. Um, so that should be something that's just given to them by default. And I mentioned earlier, but we hire domain experts. We don't want them to have to know everything it is about the cloud, what instance types, how autoscalers work, how you make a policy that's going to make your uh, server group add five instances when your CPU gets over a certain metric. Um, people shouldn't have to worry about that. There are people that are experts in that, and there are people that build the, the specific applications. Um, We've added, uh, we've actually got, compared to Asgard, um, some dedicated uh, UX designer resources on Spinnaker. It's that fellow right over there, the nicest dressed guy in the room. Um, <laughs> sorry, Jeremy. Um, but Jeremy's been involved with Spinnaker uh, since its inception, like well before myself and most of the members on the team. Uh, and there isn't a feature that goes into Spinnaker that doesn't have at least a cursory review of Jeremy. Um, and it's not just a one-time thing. We're constantly reflecting reflecting back on the usage patterns of Spinnaker to see where could we do it better. We're talking to customers, internal customers, we've got hundreds and hundreds of users that use Spinnaker on a daily basis, and they're a great source of feedback on what we've done well and what we've done poorly. So the biggest question, why bother with open source? Can we just build this ourselves and keep it internal? Uh, are there any trade secrets in here? Um, the answer is we see tremendous benefits by working with the community. Early on, we identified this need to be multi-cloud. Now, obviously, we're not going to move off of Amazon. Amazon uh, for eight or nine, eight or nine years, um, but containers are becoming a thing. There's an internal effort around uh, orchestration or a container orchestration platform called Titus. Um, we consider that from a deployment perspective to be a different cloud. You are pushing code to containers versus with AWS, you're pushing code to machine images, Amazon machine images. So we wanted a provider model that allowed us to treat two different clouds very similarly. Google got involved very early with us. We identified a lot of shared learnings between our teams um, and allowed them, and they really helped us solidify that multi-cloud model. We ultimately made better decisions because we had somebody outside of the, the walls of, of Netflix with different, uh, different beliefs, different thoughts, different approaches to this problem. So I'd like to say that we probably made a better decision or better decisions than we would have had this been kept inside of Netflix. Uh, and we've grown from that initial AWS and GCP uh, integrations to five or six different cloud providers that we have now. <coughs> it's also been a big benefit to recruitment and retention. Um, we've hired a lot. The last couple of people we've hired have actually come to the team with previous experience, either extending Spinnaker or running it in their organizations. My personal story, uh, I came from a company before that if I wanted to make a PR to an open source project, I had to go talk to a lawyer or I had to file a JIRA that went to a lawyer. They reviewed my PR somehow. Um, they asked me, <laughs> why am I making this PR? Why am I using this library? Why aren't I using some other already approved library? And then they might grant a single use um, submission so I can make that one PR and no more. Or they might say, yeah, okay, like you can make as many as you want. Very tedious process. Um, and I actually chose the delivery engineering team for um, Netflix's kind of overall uh, embracement of open source and the fact that Spinnaker was going to be built in the open. We open sourced back in November of 2015, but we had actually been working on Spinnaker for probably about 18 months. We did everything on GitHub, um, but just with private repos. We, did, we collaborated with Google, uh, regular calls, um, and then finally flipped the switch. Uh, if anybody was in the previous meeting about uh, extending Spinnaker, um, ta or Cameron talked about the broken fork model that we had with Asgard, where it was very difficult for anybody to extend Asgard and get those contributions back upstream. We know of a few very large companies that actually ported Asgard to different clouds 
which is pretty cool. Um, but those efforts never saw the light of day outside of those companies. Uh, pretty unfortunate and a, and a missed opportunity to kind of build a community. And we didn't want to repeat that with Spinnaker. This is the only slide that's going to be about Spinnaker concepts. Um, I think everybody knows what a server group is. Uh, clusters are interesting. Everybody knows that they're derived from a naming convention, um, application stack detail. That might be unfortunate for some, but it works really well for us because we've been doing that for eight or nine years. Um, there is a movement and some conversations happening right now around being able to generify that. So if you're an organization that's already got pre-existing naming patterns, um, there'll be a way that you can plug those in um, without having to go and rename all your stuff because that's that's very difficult. And of course, we've got instances, load balancers, security groups, nothing too uh, out of the ordinary for those. Often field questions around Puppet, Chef, Ansible, kind of the configuration management tools and does Finnegar play nicely with them? What does Netflix think about them? So Netflix has a very strong stance around immutable infrastructure. We don't want anything to happen after an instance launches before it's able to, to take traffic. When we need to scale, we need to scale fast. We can't have a very small chance of some um, external call being made that can fail. When you're launching 10,000 or 100,000 instances or containers, these very small chances for failure magnify and become real uh, issues. So I don't know that there is really any usage of, of these tools kind of on instance after launch. There is an opportunity during the baking process for teams to add scripts that do some stuff. Maybe they download a package, maybe they modify some configuration, but that happens at the bake, which is after your Jenkins job has produced a Debian file um, and before that Debian file is turned into an AMI. So you can run some logic in there and then the result of that is snapshotted and becomes an immutable image that is then smeared across the cloud. Okay, now a little bit of fun stuff. Um, basically, we've been operating Spinnaker for about three years. Uh, we'll talk a little bit, Cameron in the previous talk, talk a little bit about how we build packages. Um, we certainly don't fork. We don't use any of the pre-built images that are floating around. Anything that's on the getting started guides um, is not something that we, we use. We produce um, our own packages. There'll be a little grail snippet on the next slide that kind of gives a very high level example of what these packages look like. Um, but our packages certainly can contain configuration. So they'll contain a YAML file. So we might have a gate-netflix uh, repository internally that maps one-to-one -one with the open source gate uh, repository. Uh, we'll depend on very specific versions of the open source releases. Uh, we try to stay current. So whenever, we, whenever there's a new uh, release cut in open source, Certainly, if it has any of our code in it, we'll bump internally and we'll start we'll start the deployment process. Um, but this provides an opportunity to also layer in our own code. Um, I would encourage everybody to watch Cameron's talk or look at look at his examples um, to kind of get a feel for the types of extensions we have. Um, and I'll talk about a few later on. But we can we effectively build Spinnaker so that we can extend it in any way that Netflix needs. And anything that we do, it's possible for the community to do as well. We don't have any secret sauce. We're not breaking the rules or, or bending the rules to our own benefit. Um, anything we do, the community can do. It might just take a little bit of effort. Um, we'll talk a little bit about our, our deployments, but every service uh, in Spinnaker is deployed independently. We don't have any shared services. Um, we might run multiple instances of a service don't have one big instance running six or seven services side by side. That goes for Redis as well. Uh, this is just a snippet of the Gradle file. So you can see a very specific version of gate 292. That's probably months or, or years old now. I haven't updated this example in a while. Um, but we can depend on that. And then we can depend on uh, some local uh, artifact gate extension in this case that might include a new API. So I mentioned earlier, every service that, that needs a Redis, so like Gade, Igor, Orca, Cloud Driver, gets its own Redis. Uh, we actually have our own um, machine image for Redis. It includes a sidecar that emits metrics. 
uh, in, a, in a slide or two, I'll talk about kind of our story around monitoring metrics. <coughs> we capture metrics from Redis just as we do for the services themselves. Uh, we did try ElastiCache quite a while ago now, uh, and it didn't work all that well for us. We had issues when it would try and fail over to a replica or promote a replica. Um, it was out of date or we had timeouts. Um, not sure if the issue was on our side in hindsight or if it was a problem with ElastiCache at the time. Uh, anyhow, it's not what we use. Uh, we certainly, we treat Redis just as any other service. We want to have a zero downtime upgrade wherever possible. Upgrades come about from maybe there's a security patch that needs to be applied to the uh, base AMI that Redis is running on. Maybe there's a new base AMI. Um, we don't upgrade them as frequently as everything else, but we need, when we do upgrade them, we need to be able to do them with zero downtime. There is no opportunity at Netflix throughout the day to take an outage. We can't say, 3.30 a.m., chances are nobody's using Spinnaker. Let's take it down for a little bit so we can flip an ENI. It doesn't happen. In fact, those early morning hours are probably our highest traffic um, API times. You'll hear why in a few slides, um, but there is no time during the day that somebody isn't using and depending on Spinnaker. Uh, catch me probably outside the talk. I don't think I have enough time to talk about how we do some of these zero downtime um, upgrades, but it's probably worthwhile for anybody who's, who's running Spinnaker in production to at least understand how we do it, and you can choose to follow a similar pattern or, or not. I think it goes without saying, Front 50 is backed by a versioned S3 bucket. So Cloud Driver's cool. Uh, we run a lot of accounts. Some of those accounts are tremendously large. Um, right now, we're looking at about 10,000 ops per second out of our Redis. Um, we're considering Dynamite. Um, we can talk offline about that. Um, Dynamite basically could provide us with a more uh, linear ability to scale um, our Redis cluster, but it doesn't work so well with multi-key keys. So that, uh, multi-key operations. So that 10,000 ops, um, a lot of those are multi-key operations. So if you flattened all those out, we're looking at 500, maybe 700,000 uh, ops per second against Redis. Uh, and we kind of only see that, see that growing, particularly as we add more accounts. We started a number of months ago, six or seven months ago with replicas. So we run a number of Cloud Driver Redis replicas with read-only Cloud Driver clusters in front of them. Our first uh, step along this was to split read-only API traffic from gate. So anything coming in the front door asking for server notification or clusters for an application, um, all that traffic would go to a dedicated read-only Cloud Driver. So we would separate that from all the um, mutating operations that are happening, largely driven by Orca. That actually worked pretty well. Uh, it bought us probably a few months of time. We thought we were we thought we were doing good, uh, and we thought we had kind of put the performance problem to bed. Then, of course, some teams came around and decided they wanted to send tens of thousands of operations to us per day. Um, and that kind of overwhelmed us. They were not read operations, they were write operations. So we needed a way to push the sharding model um, down a little bit. So what we've done is fired up a few more replicas. Right now we're running probably well, four replicas dedicated to workout, uh, and we have the ability to shard requests to each of those replicas. And we can do so on a number of dimensions. First off, execution type. Spinnaker, um, as I hope everybody knows, has two types of, of um, executions. At some point, they'll just be the same thing with a, with a uh, single parameter differentiating them. But right now, they're two things, orchestrations and pipeline. <coughs> orchestrations are typically ad hoc things that you would do in the UI or API requests. So we're able to split off pipelines that are running from uh, normal API requests that are coming in. Now that's pretty good. We also can do it by origin. This is important um, in order to maintain a usable user interface under the threat of all this API traffic coming in. 
So we're able to dedicate some capacity to serving UI requests, independent of requests that are coming in uh, programmatically via the API. So that the rest of the system is on fire. Hopefully you can come into the UI and uh, work your way out of a problem. Hopefully we can resize server groups, we can kind of scale up um, without having to uh, go to a different stack or go to the console. Uh, the other big one is um, our encoding team sends tens of thousands of requests to us for a single application. Um, we are basically at the point now where we can just dedicate some capacity to them and kind of forget about what they're doing. They're no longer going to have impact on the rest of the system. This is probably the number one thing that both, both addressed that team's ability to scale because they were having problems. They were um, kind of running into uh, the, the normal Spinnaker traffic and kind of needed to be separated off, as well as the normal Spinnaker traffic was getting um, kind of bogged down by all the uh, all the encoding API requests. So I would say being able to shard by application is probably the number one thing in the last few months that has bought us some headroom. We haven't done it yet, but we're likely to support sharding by actual authenticated user. We have another uh, tool, actually Titus, who's making a lot of calls to Spinnaker, but across dozens or hundreds of applications. We'd like to similarly be able to dedicate some capacity to them to de-risk the rest of Spinnaker when those things are happening. Again, all of this is just configuration in uh, Orca. Um, and reach out to me if you'd like more details on how you actually do this. Um, other talks have probably mentioned Atlas. It's our in-house telemetry platform. Um, I believe aspects of it have been open source. But I don't think the whole um, picture that we're running here is available uh, open source. Specifically, uh, it includes dashboarding and alerting capabilities. So we can emit all of our metrics, be it from any Spinnaker service or our Redis insist, as I mentioned earlier. We can chart those things. Uh, we can alert off of them if they cross over thresholds. Uh, alerting might be page us, email us. Uh, we can terminate instances. Um, you can kick off uh, jobs to do more uh, ad hoc. Um, Type of, type of activities. There's a talk tomorrow from Eric, uh, from Google Eric, uh, who will talk about kind of the monitoring and metrics capabilities in the open source world. Um, so we'll kind of talk, and there'll be some uh, some views into Atlas to show how we're operating it here, here at Netflix. Uh, but there is a bit of a story, at least around the metrics side of things, metrics and dashboarding uh, in the open source community. <clears throat> All of our logs, go to an Elk stack. So those Spinnaker packages that I mentioned we produced earlier all have some configuration that sets up a log stash agent on each service that just forwards logs to Elasticsearch. And then we can use Kibana to search across all of the Spinnaker instances for problems. We store about a week's worth of logs there. We seem to be more than enough for uh, diagnosing problems. Uh, this is a bit of a, in my opinion, but I, I think everybody's got to have at least some strategy around monitoring, alerting, and logging in order to really effectively run Spinnaker in production. It's really difficult to log on to instances and start tailing logs. Um, at that point, you're just being reactive and you're not going to be um, proactively made aware when the system starts uh, perhaps tipping over. This is an example of one of our, our graphs in our dashboards. You'll see more uh, tomorrow, as well as hit me up offline. Testing and promotion. So we run a number of stacks of Spinnaker. We run a test stack, pre-staging, and main. Uh, test looks at only a small subset of accounts, whereas pre-staging and main kind of index uh, the world at Netflix, just with different uh, uh, number of instances backing it. We're continuously running some validation pipelines in those two ladder stacks, so in pre-staging and main. These validation pipelines are doing things like uh, a bake and deploy, and they're running these things every five or 10 minutes uh, and alerting us if they ever fail. They also do a promotion, um, basically a find image from a cluster, and then deploy that image somewhere else, uh, and a canary. So we're trying to find ways where we can be outside of like above unit testing, where we can actually be alert, alerted to uh, real world 
degradations that might be a result of two different pushes being made almost simultaneously that don't play together very well. Uh, it can be tough to, to test those things um, in isolation. I might be lying here. I think it's reasonably accurate um, in that we do probably about 10 deploys of the core spinning group services per day. I think the UI guys are, are terribly efficient and probably push DEC um, two or three times a day. The rest of us, Cloud Driver is a big one, Work is a big one. And a lot of this is around just, just new features or parts of features or uh, maybe bug fixes in response to um, some, some, somebody telling us we've broken something. We always red black. We optimize for the ability to fall back. Um, so we'll always we'll always do a red black and keep the old server group around for uh, about an hour. We have a Reaper script running. I think we run it as part of a just a Jenkins job that makes API calls to all of our services, just looking for any disabled server group that's been disabled for more than an hour. And if we find any of those, we'll just shrink it to zero. We won't destroy it because we still want to know what the previous version was and kind of have a one button rollback, but we'll resize it to zero because chances are if it's lasted an hour, it's going to be all right. We get enough traffic in an hour to tell us if something's something good or bad. Uh, it's a little bit, I, I, we'd like this to be faster. Uh, it takes us about 30 or 40 minutes if we're on the ball to go from code commit to precision. A lot of this time is spent in Travis CI. And so you'll wait for your PR to build, we'll merge the PR, you wait for your cutter release, you'll wait for that release to finish, and you've got to kind of um, be monitoring all these things. Uh, we'd like it if this was if this was less. Uh, and it's something that we're kind of always looking for ways to shrink it. We don't want to be caught in uh, just in, in unnecessary build time. All right, so the fun stuff. Uh, where have we messed up and caused problems for users? Uh, so I've got maybe four or five of these things. There's lots more, but these are the ones that are kind of top of mind and, and maybe particularly interesting. Uh, so we run a circuit breaker. Uh, there's a library called Hystrix that we've got kind of uh, integrated into a number of the services. Uh, at one point in time, we always have flaky Jenkins masters, but at one point in time, one flaky Jenkins master would take out all of Igor, which basically took out all of the ability to talk to any Jenkins master. And that was because we only had a circuit breaker uh, in gate around calls to Igor. Uh, we fixed this by putting a circuit breaker around calls to the individual masters. So now if we've got Jenkins master that goes flaky, it's just going to stop requests to that Jinx master until it until it recovers or doesn't recover, it doesn't matter. But the rest of the system is still gonna is still gonna be happy. Um, requests to other Jenkins masters are still gonna flow through. This is a fun one. We've lost our Orca Redis like a couple of times. Um, one time accidental, I don't recommend doing a flush all accidentally on your Orca, Orca Redis. Um, it's one of the side effects of like being able to log on to instances. Sometimes you think it's your local box and it happens to be your production Redis. Um, when you lose a Reddit, when you lose the Orca Redis, you actually lose all the execution history. Um, and we don't necessarily have backups enabled for our Reddit instances. Um, so the couple of times that we have lost it, one time we lost it for an out of, out of memory that we didn't catch in time. Um, we lost everything and it's a very painful recovery process for us as well as it inconveniences a bunch of users. Um, we've got a new guy on our team, Asher, who comes, up to, comes to us from uh, the core SRE group here at Netflix. And kind of one of the things he picked up on early on is, why don't you have uh, backups enabled on your Redis? Even if they're just stored locally, um, but we could push them to S3 as well to at least account for uh, an instance going away and, and like something happening because things happen, um, you would at least not lose all the history. Uh, so we're going to do that. Uh, that's a smart thing for us. Um, we also have uh, tighter monitoring and alerting on that, so we know well in advance of us hitting uh, hitting a threshold. And we've got various cleanups and process that will um, tidy up extremely old uh, uh, executions. Longer term, we are looking at Dynamite, um, same thing as Cloud Driver, as a way to uh, eliminate the uh, single Redis tenancy. Is there a particular usage case that causes this, or is it just 
the amount of usage? Um, amount of usage, and in, in the one case, uh, like a poorly sized Redis, an extremely small Redis. Um, and we identified actually the other day, we caught it in advance, but there was an issue that was stopping the automated cleanup process uh, from running. So it just, uh, as we looked week over week, the memory usage was just steadily going up until it tripped our, tripped our threshold. Our thresholds are now set sufficiently low that we'll probably have three or four weeks before we'll actually um, get an out of memory. So if we ignore an alert for three or four weeks, we deserve the pain that it's going to cause. <laughs> Uh, this is another another fun one. So I mentioned kind of uh, big applications sending us so much traffic that it overwhelms things. Uh, we had situations where it overwhelmed all of Spinnaker and the UI was unresponsive. Um, fortunately, we had a pre-staging stack that we were able to sneak into and resize the main clusters. Um, but ideally, that doesn't happen. Uh, we've kind of solved this with sharding at the kind of Orca cloud driver level, as well as the ability to throttle. So the V3 uh, Orca, if anybody caught that talk earlier today, um, probably mentioned some ability to throttle messages on a per application basis. So we're able to do that. We're able to set a reasonably low throttle um, and kind of bump people as necessary. Uh, extremely large clusters. This probably isn't all that common out, out in the world, um, but we've started to see some applications with clusters that have north of 30,000 instances in them. Uh, and we had some rather inefficient code that didn't really become a problem until we had these gigantic clusters where when you did a deploy, we wait for those instances to become healthy. And the process of waiting would actually load the cluster filter the server groups down to the one that you're changing and then check the instances. Um, so it, it was loading a 30,000 instance cluster every 15 seconds waiting for instances to come up. And Amazon takes in the best case probably a few minutes for an instance to come up. Um, so it was just killing the system. Um, we were able to use metrics to kind of identify the uh, calls that were exhibiting this behavior and then just kind of fix that bad behavior. Um, Part of the fix was uh, to the AWS cloud, cloud provider. Um, so there's a chance that if another cloud provider comes around and starts having 30,000 instance uh, server groups, that they might may need to make similar improvements that we made to AWS. Uh, and this was actually just fixed uh, kind of last week. Um, but we have some very large or like kind of large-ish number of uh, objects in our S3 bucket, uh, specifically around pipelines. At one point, we did some cleanup, but at one point last week we had around 14 or 15,000 pipelines in there. And they were being, mod some something was modifying pipelines with such a rate that uh, although Front50 tries to maintain a uh, in-sync, uh, in-memory cache of things, things were being mutated so often that the cache was kind of constantly invalidated and had to keep going back to the S3 and looking at these 15,000 objects to see what's been modified. That resulted in uh, times to do all kinds of operations in Spinnaker, taking upwards of 10 or 20 seconds, um, completely unacceptable. And we actually solved this um, in the kind of AWS S3 use case by using S3 events. So now um, anybody who's got an S3 bucket can wire that bucket up to an SNS topic. And then when Front50 launches, it'll create a subscription to that topic and use events that flow through, um, flow through that to keep its cache in sync. And AWS kind of has an SLA where those where those events should be delivered in less than a second. And we've typically seen in the small number of hundreds of milliseconds. So we haven't had to change the rest of the system. Um, and we've noticed, like, we haven't had to change the rest of the system. And everything uh, appears to uh, just account for what might be a few hundred seconds of latency. Um, and now those calls are no longer taking 20 seconds. They're now down to maybe 200, 300 milliseconds, and we're serving almost everything out of the cache. So a huge, a huge win for Spinnaker, because uh, we had gotten a lot of complaints. Is there any that. effort to get that into uh, ECP and the other 
Um, or is that a problem with them? You know? I, I don't know. So what's the question? I was wondering about other providers than S3 bias. What was the question? If uh, that um, particular instance with a uh, large number of objects is both a problem with uh, using GCP um, buckets or uh, and or if that same solution would work there. Yeah, well, the solution is specific to S3. Yeah. And the um, GC Google Cloud Storage yeah. works a little different, but um, I'm, I'm not aware of that problem, but we also don't have that, I haven't hit that number of pipelines yet. So we can follow up off Definitely. offline. Perfect, okay. thanks. Um, so partnerships, a lot of the success here at Netflix has been built on uh, internal partnerships with different uh, aspects of the company. One of the big ones is around pod security. We've got a lot of extensions that allow us to do Netflix specific things uh, that we're doing with CloudStack. Um, one of the earliest things, not, not, not necessary to, to Netflix, uh, but we run Spinnaker in a dedicated account. This allows us to limit the blast radius to set the AWS uh, rate limits appro appropriately, as well as restrict the permissions to uh, a much smaller set of applications. So that was one of the first things that we worked with CloudSec to do. We've since done a lot more. Anybody who was in Cameron's talk would have heard about what we've done for um, application IAM role creation. So whenever an application launches, um, we call out to a CloudSec Lambda, which gives them the power to make a determination on what those IAM roles can be. Uh, and again, this is something that anybody in the community can do uh, very similarly. The, the, the hook points are there. Uh, we've also got the ability to restrict which applications can launch with so-called privileged IAM roles. So we prevent other applications from launching with uh, Spinnaker IAM role. Uh, we talked about user data signing. This is a way that cloud security can assert that only um, a certain app, a certain set of applications are able to deploy um, deploy applications to AWS uh, and receive uh, uh, certificates and secret key material. If CloudSec detects that um, an instance has just been launched, say via the AWS console, um, that won't get any certificates, so the chances are that application won't be able to launch, and it certainly won't get access to any secrets. Yeah. Sorry, quick question. Um, so uh, these applications, um, are these like the Spinnaker sub-applications, or are these your like client applications? These are any user of, so okay. any user of Spinnaker. And so they're all being brought up in the same account? Nope. Oh, okay, these nope. are in your... These are all in different, different accounts. Okay, that makes a lot more sense, sorry. Was... No problem. Thanks. And we can, I can I'm happy to dig into any of this. Any of this. Uh, so we uh, early on did mutual TLS between all the Spinnaker services. The next slide kind of paints a picture of what this looks like. But if you're ever interested in a certificate management self-service solution, uh, there's a project from our cloud site group called Lemur. Uh, it's been a kind of a, a big lifesaver for me. We're able to manage our own certificate authorities in that. Uh, in my experience from the last companies, we had to go to the equivalent of IT ops if we ever wanted a CA, and we had to have them do everything, do everything for us. Uh, so this greatly simplifies that process. And this is what it looks like for us. So Gate, the Spinnaker API Gateway service, is the only thing that trusts uh, connections from the greater Spinnaker community. Uh, everything behind that, all the other Spinnaker services, only trust certificates that are minted off of our uh, internal certificate authorities. So those are CAs that our team managers. So the only thing that can talk are other Spinnaker services or members of the delivery engineering team. So we can push these, we can kind of allow um, from a security group um, perspective, we can allow access from our laptops to these services because nobody's going to have an appropriate certificate that lets them talk to it. Um, so that's been useful for us because we're able to call management APIs or uh, from our laptops and just kind of check on the state of the world. Uh, capacity planning is another fun one. Uh, there's been some posts over the last year on our uh, Netflix tech blog about um, the internal spot market. Uh, and that's backed by 
uh, reservation report API. Uh, this API, because Spinnaker's got a view of the entire world, it's able to surface both uh, reservations across all accounts, as well as usage of uh, like launched instances by instance type, by AZ, um, and by account, so that people are able to borrow, take advantage of consolidated billing, which allows somebody to, to receive the financial benefit of an RI uh, across accounts. So for example, the uh, encoding team um, is able to programmatic, they programmatically send upwards of 20,000 requests a day uh, to dramatically scale their fleet up and down. Uh, we're talking 10, probably 10 times at least uh, from, from lows to highs per day and big number of instances. We'll talk specifically about them, but big number of instances. And we've seen this, we've seen their, their degree of scaling probably increase uh, in order of magnitude in less than a year. Um, they're at the point now where they're able to effectively take advantage of almost 100% of the trough across all regions. And my point earlier about there being no no downtime for Spinnaker is that a lot of the capacity comes out in the middle of the night. Um, that just seems to be the natural like spot in our um, overall auto scaling where there's a trough uh, sufficient for people to borrow. And that's happening say 10 or 11 p.m. to three or four a.m. So they're scaling 10 times during that window and then dropping right away. Uh, we've had to do a bunch of optimizations in Spinnaker that everybody takes advantage of to allow these types of calls to um, happen very quickly because if they slow down, they're going to push uh, the rest of the company into on-demand and it's going to start costing uh, Netflix money rather than saving us millions of dollars. And this trough usage uh, provides a lot of opportunities for teams to experiment that previously they didn't have uh, capacity for. I have a question on that. Yeah. Do you have uh, like a stage that like just deploy on demand in, in that trough or do they, are they hitting that through uh, API? They're doing all API okay. API requests. Um, so they kind of maintain their own view of the world and what work they have. They support all instance types. So they're they're doing they're doing a ton. Okay. Uh, who's heard of Chaos Monkey? Cool. Uh, Chaos Monkey used to be an, a standalone application that would hit AWS APIs directly. Uh, sometime last year, uh, a rewrite happened and it was integrated directly with Spinnaker and they were able to take advantage of, of the fact that Spinnaker has got multiple cloud providers. So now any user of those cloud providers can wire up a Chaos Monkey and start using it. Uh, just kind of wrapping up here, some interesting numbers. Um, we've got about 2,500 applications with at least one server group deployed. Uh, I suspect most of these are going to have server groups in multiple regions. The majority of our applications are uh, at least in, in two regions, if not three. Uh, we trimmed down the pipelines a little bit, so now we're running a healthy 9,500 pipelines. I would say with the advent of managed pipeline templates, uh, it's my expectation that this number will drop quite a bit. Um, we've just started to, to roll out um, pipeline templates um, outside of a few early adopters. Um, it doesn't make sense to have uh, 6,000 odd pipelines doing deploys. Uh, chances are they're, they're doing things pretty similarly, and there's got to be some common templates in there. Uh, we've got a lot of pipelines that are using expressions, so much so that we've started to invest in making it even easier to write these expressions. So building tooling to uh, improve the error messages around expressions, uh, considering how we can do a better job when people are writing expressions in the first place. Can you use uh, previous executions of the pipeline to see the context so that people have more visibility into what's available when they're writing these expressions? It's an it's a extremely powerful thing, um, but with great power, you can kind of back yourself into a corner, and it's really difficult for us to catch some of that stuff ahead of time. Um, there was an interesting uh, security uh, vulnerability that was caught by our CloudSec group where you could um, you, you could do some stuff with an expression, like the obvious one is you could do this not exit in an expression and, and kind of kill your, or your Orca instances. Nobody did that, um, but you could also do, uh, you could load some, uh, you could load code remotely um, based on what was available uh, on the class path um, for expression. We've since uh, 
uh, provided an ability to whitelist which classes you're allowed to use an expression. And so I'd like to say that most of those uh, vulnerabilities are probably addressed now. The future. So our team is growing. Uh, we're about 50% bigger than when we were when we first open sourced. Uh, I was mentioning earlier that we've added a couple of people that came with actual Spinnaker experience. That's super cool. Uh, we love that. Um, we obviously, uh, containers are becoming a bigger and bigger thing here at Netflix, so we're not going to lose sight of that, um, as well as other types of deployments that we're doing here. Um, the CDN guys, although we don't have a lot of native support for what they're doing, um, they've wired through some crazy complicated pipelines that just call it to Jenkins jobs. So they're able to do pushes to um, all the CDNs, um, all the uh, staged rollouts that they've always been able to do, uh, and they do that with a Spinnaker pipeline. That, unfortunately, it's probably about 125 stages, so the UI doesn't render that very well. And he showed it in his opening keynote, all those like teeny tiny, probably like one pixel wide boxes. Um, but that works for them. They were able to take something that wasn't built for them and, and take advantage. Uh, and over probably the next quarter or two or three, uh, we'll be adding more native support. Um, a Netflix specific thing in all likelihood, um, but we'll build it in the same way that anybody in the community could. And we talk about managed pipeline templates and how that's going to allow us to drop that um, overall pipeline count. Um, but we're also talking about like what can we do in a more declarative model across multiple different entity types? Um, how can we take advantage of the context and knowledge of the overall um, account structures that teams have to maybe let them in the simple case like I've got a security group that I want to uh, maintain across multiple regions. How can I do that easier? It's very uh, inefficient to do that in the UI right now, um, but I don't want to get down to the nitty gritty of having to specify explicit security groups. Maybe I just want to say my application, it needs ingress from these other applications and Spinnaker, you figure out what that security group should look like. That's just one small example of some of the some of the thoughts and direction that we're likely to go in. Uh, we'll have more accounts. I don't know how many accounts we'll have, but um, over time, just the natural growth of the company um, kind of dictates additional accounts, and that will, um, in all likelihood, kind of put some stresses on Cloud Driver, and we'll have to figure it out. Uh, and I suspect the rest of the community will take advantage of that. I know Shipstead mentioned in their earlier talk that they're running 100 accounts. That's a little more than we've got right now. And if they've got problems with that, uh, we'll kind of work together and, and come to some resolution. Obviously, Netflix is, is always growing. Uh, nobody's going to lighten the, the load on us. Nobody's going to cut us a break. They're only going to uh, have higher and higher expectations of us. So we don't really get to take our foot off the off the pedal. We've always got to keep going. And with that, uh, that's all I've got. Uh, got a few minutes for, uh, for questions. First of all, thank you for a very informative presentation. Thank you. Um, you mentioned about containers. We're talking about um, deploying the Spinnaker core services in containers and not one uh, service in, in EC2 versus multiple instances in different containers in a EC2. Or you're talking about leveraging Kubernetes or something and help the application deployment teams. We're actually talking about the application deployment teams. Okay. We've got an internal um, project called Titus. Which is our think of it as think of it as our own Kubernetes, and that's what teams are starting to use. Um, and Spinnaker has uh, support for that, just as if uh, equivalent support to AWS. Uh, it's not open sourced yet, so it just lives in our in our Netflix builds. But an end user sees it the same way. Is there any plan to containerize Spinnaker services um, and? Optimize and you were optimizations, vinegar optimization scope. Do you have plans to continue as a core service? Um, I think there's, I, I looked at some of the other members of the community. I think there might be a couple of panel discussions later. Okay. Um, it's not something that Netflix itself will will drive. We've got some opinions on how we how we build and package Spinnaker internally, um, but we're totally supportive of the effort or of the open, of any open source effort to make it easier to deploy Spinnaker, be it containers or, or anything else. Google definitely has 
uh, thoughts and they want to make that as easy as possible. Okay. Uh, so I'd suggest looking for a panel or reaching out offline. Um, we at Capital One, we started the journey and we have, we've been supporting a lot of containerized application deployments, but internal, the Spinnaker deployment itself, we started containerizing, but we are still on a early stages of that journey. Wanted to see if you have internally in your Netflix, if you have done that. We haven't, we're not like, probably not likely to containerize Spinnaker because we want to be as low in the stack as possible. And the uh, Titus in our case actually is dependent on Spinnaker to deploy its infrastructure. And for us, we want to avoid that circular dependency. Um, but in your case, that might not be the situation. Um, so yeah, keep on asking questions about containers. Thank you. Other uh, questions? So yeah. I'm just curious if you use Halyard internally at all. Or we don't use Halyard. Yeah. Uh, not against it. We we were doing this. Yeah. Uh, well, you use AWS, right? So, so that, right. Uh, I don't know. Actually, I. So we've set up on AWS using Halyard and Spinnaker onto our Kubernetes instances with. So it installs, you know, containers onto the Kubernetes cluster for all of Spinnaker, including Redis. But it's different. It's like there's one Redis pod. Um, so, you know, in particular, I was thinking about how did that all work. Yeah, I, I hit up Lars. I'm not the That's okay. most educated on Halyard, unfortunately. There's a Halyard talk. Just that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a recorded Halyard talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we start to get into like multi cloud and you know even uh, and, uh, uh, for scaling, speaker, are there thoughts or plans around kind of the localization of the video? I mean, so, like, you, you yep. have your one AWS deployed speaker, but it's managing potentially five different cloud driven. Services and your failure to maintain that is your single AWS. Yep, yep, yep. So, some preliminary discussions. I think a lot of that might be driven on our side around if we add a whole bunch of accounts, how do we how do we scale to manage that without being um, having the one serving account becoming a single point of failure? Um, I don't know where we'll land. Um, I know there are some people in the community that are running uh, different models. That kind of might care more about um, fault domains, particularly run cloud driver. Um, if you're interested in that, like reach out to us and, and we conversation. No, your direction yet. Okay. Uh, for your product, uh, Spinnaker, like uh, set up is it still pretty much like all the teams are using it at one Spinnaker, and like we have this separation of like uh, people. Sorry, the last bit. Like, is it still only the separation that like really have like a payment or like PCI? Kind yep. Of, yeah. Uh, so we so ninety nine percent of all deployments of Spanker or all deployments of Netflix use Spanker in the main production account. We do have a uh, another Spanker installation that's used only by the our PCI environment. <laughs> So are you, one of the concerns that we had, um, we're trying to follow the same model, but we're concerned about baking in the same location just because there's a security constraint there about how, um, you know, application A doesn't really trust application B's code, right? Yep. And if they're baked in the same account, yep. Yep. So you have two different instances, different code bases. Yep. Have you guys thought about that? We haven't been pressed on it. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, our our call tech has been okay with, with that. Right. And for everybody else's benefit, we bake. Everybody bakes in the same account. And what Spinnaker will do is we'll just promote or we'll do an allow launch to the other accounts. Um, but all those AMIs exist in uh, one one account. Um, we may get pushed right. at some point and need to kind of think about. Our team's going to take on the bakery. Here at Netflix, yeah. so it might be our team that also needs to solve this problem here. Um, well, Matt, we might encounter it before you guys. So probably. If we have an answer, we will hear <laughs> Absolutely. And Matt Duffler uh, from Google is is kind of the Roscoe guy. Yeah. Uh, we run our own our own bakery uh, that's okay. API yeah. API compliant with what Roscoe is doing, yeah. um, but we don't run Roscoe. Uh, but uh, Matt Duffler from Google might be a good guy to paint. Okay. Cool. <laughs> 
question. Question? Yep. Yeah, how do you, uh, how do, you do it multi-region spin? Uh, do you have uh, spinnakers deployed deploy in each region that you operate? Do you pick uh, AMIs in each region? How does that work? From uh, like failing over spinnaker perspective? Yes, but also getting AMIs into different regions. So, short answer for the like, do we run spinnaker in different regions? We, uh, we aspire to doing that, but we're not quite there yet. Um, but for everything else, all the other services, we will bake in every region. Um, so we have a bakery, uh, bakery clients running in every region. So application owners will bake in each region, and they'll use that AMI. Uh, we don't copy AMIs across across regions. We're almost. I think we're out of time here. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. I'll be around for the next two days if you've got any questions.